Hi, I'm Chris Delion, founder of Home Team Game Dev. I'm going to walk you through how to get the most out of Home Team Game Dev membership. So this is going to be applicable whether you're viewing this on our website, deciding whether to apply, whether you've had your application accepted and are in the decision period, or even if you've already joined and are still getting your bearings. Of course, if you've already joined, you also have our orientation video to help you figure out setting up all of our services and accounts. But this is going to work at a high level too. So for starters, Home Team Game Dev, what this is about, right? It's about learning to make video games. We do this online collaboratively team projects on a longer term time frame than jams so projects are anywhere from six weeks on the short end to six months on the long end and with mentorship with direct support to turn to as a bit of background i guess first for myself i've been making video games since 1997 i started an in industry in 2005 as a technical game designer with electronic arts making console games from there went on to become an early hire at the company that became top cap san francisco the time i was with it in four person house startup well before that phase and then from there made some iphone games that were top sellers but a lot of my time since then has been focused on education on training on helping other people get started in making games and i started doing that in a way from starting some college clubs at carnegie mellon and the georgia tech where people were pumping out games using our processes in ways that were helping them do better in interviews strengthen their portfolios we were getting people who had never made games before putting them together and then with a system and a structure in place that led to them finishing their games on time and better work than any one of them could have done alone and so the combination of that with the other way i was teaching before home team game dev was i did private lessons with people i would schedule one-on-ones usually weekly with dozens of people around the globe and then for years i'd work with people from no background to people who been doing it for a while and help them get their next few games out at a higher tier of development now this home team game dev is a combination of those as well as various materials i brought together so in addition to being our founder of home team I'm also our main trainer. I still meet with our members, our leads I can meet with every single week. All of our other members I can meet with up to every other week. And that can be about answering their questions about programming, about game design, about project management, about collaborative questions that come up. But that's also something where I authored most of our materials we use in the group. Membership includes a textbook, which outside of our group, over 200,000 people have bought. Membership in our group includes video courses that outside of our group, more than a quarter of a million people have taken. And these are things which combined with our community, our structure, our process have led to over 90 games being released in the past, well, I guess since 2015, nearly five years. Now, as an overview, you can read more about the details of what goes on on hometeamgamedev.com. That's where you'll see things like we do use Unity C Sharp and JavaScript on Canvas. A lot of what we use the JavaScript on Canvas for is less about learning JavaScript for its own sake and more about getting practice at pre-engine programming. One of the things that I found as a trainer is that if someone's only ever used an engine, Unreal, Unity, or another option, they're not getting the full leverage and power out of it. They're not seeing all the concepts that they're that they're available to them because there's things they take for granted as kind of a black box of what the engine's doing. And so we found as an educational, as a practice step, it's really helpful to go back and do some retro game development. Think of some 70s and 80s games that you enjoy. And there are things where without using an engine, we have to write our own code to handle input filtering, to handle graphics being displayed, to handle sound effects, audio buffers sometimes. And that kind of experience adds to our mental tool set that oftentimes in an engine, there's a smarter or clever or faster or simpler way to do something, or just to get your game to feel different than every other game that's done in that engine, it helps to have those tool sets. And so a lot of our approach is encouraging starting classically, and that's where our video courses that are included start. We have a lot of other trainers in the group. So even though I emphasize I'm our main trainer, and like I say, leads can meet with me every week, other members can meet with me up to every other week. We also have trainers who specialize in art, that's Kyle at this moment. Ryan, Audio, Karen, Level Design, Kartik, UI, and Juice. And there are people who also members can meet with up to every other week, separate from meeting with me, if they have questions about game audio, game art, level design, or UI and Juice. And those are things that help make their games better. And we specifically do this in the context of our community projects, so that when every member has access to this, even if you're not the person who's using the meetings with Karen about level design, using the meetings with Ryan about audio, using meetings with me, about being a more effective project leader or about solving your game programming questions, the whole team benefits from the fact that everybody else on that team has these resources and support and mentorship to turn to makes everything work better. Lana Lanier helps us out in both groups now as our morale specialist in the chat, helps discourage crunch, helps encourage sustainable habits and self-care. Now, one of the things that's happened about home team game dev as we've grown is we figured out that there was a basically a size at which when it gets bigger than that, it loses some of the same community vibe. When a community gets too big, too crowded, and you see this on discords all the time or subreddits, you no longer can really get to know everybody and you can no longer figure out kind of your place with that community. 
And so we've actually now butted into two separate groups. We call those groups Apollo, that's our original community, and Outpost. They use mostly the same approach, mostly the same structure, mostly the same materials. They have access to mostly the same trainers, but there are a couple differences. So for example, the Apollo group meetings are live every single week. Now, since 2015, we've been having a meeting at 11.30 a.m. Sundays, 11.30 a.m. Pacific, California time. And people from around the world can tune into that. We have people in 19 time zones who have. But that, that's a tricky time for some time zones. If you're East Asia, if you're in Australia or New Zealand, that might be Monday morning. And so Outpost Group, rather than having live meetings, the leads just send me the videos ahead of time of their updates, of their pitches. And then we collaborate completely asynchronously. So it doesn't matter what time zone you're in. You can still take part in either group. But if you're an Outpost, it's a little bit easier to pitch and lead. Christopher Kaitila, he's in our bigger group, Apollo, or older group. He's there as a mentor in residence or a collaborative mentor. And what that means is that we figured out that a lot of the learning you do is not done in a classroom format. It's not done from someone lecturing to you. It's done by looking at what your peers are doing. And so by having an experienced peer, Krister here, someone who's been making games for 35 years or so, when he's in there, he's chipping in an impressive way to render more fish on the screen. He's chipping in a really nifty technique for loading levels in a smarter way or an improvement on the graphics, on the audio code, on something else or game structure. And he's just collaborating on the projects with everybody else. He hops around between projects, chipping in here and there, helps them polish, helps them sparkle, helps them shine. In the process, our members can look at that, learn from his code examples, ask him questions. He's there as a resource in our bigger community, Apollo. One of the strengths of the fact that an outpost as a smaller community, a little more scrappy, more startup vibe, we don't have a mentor in residence, is that our leads, our project leads are filling those shoes and growing into it. We also have a couple of game industry career guides. So, and I clarify very clearly here on the page, we're not fundamentally a group about trying to get people jobs. We're not a vocational training group. We're not trying to be a trade school. We're a group that teaches you how to build games, right? If we were a musician's group, we'd be teaching you how to play guitar, not saying here's how to sell tickets to a concert. That said, naturally, people who are coming into our group get experience, even if they never had it before, building games, releasing games, being on teams. And if they find that they like that and they have an interest in pursuing a career in it, we have a couple of resources or a couple of support mentors they can turn to. Rob Coble helps potential people with questions about navigating studio careers, resume, CV questions, interviewing, networking, as well as finding the kind of work that someone's looking for, fitting themselves into that ecosystem. And he came to us with more than a dozen years experience as full sales career services. So helping professionally placeable in industry. On the other side, Jake Burkett. I think he's got like the sixth most popular talk from GDC history on YouTube. But he's an indie. He's been going also for 13, 15 years or so. And uh, he's been just making successful indie games for so many years, keeping himself afloat, doing it, being smart, being strategic about it. And so for members who are more interested in pursuing that pathway in life, they can meet with him. Now, in either one of these cases, I also want to clarify these other trainers, anybody in our group can meet with up to every other week for the other skill trainers, up to every week with me if they're project lead or every other week if they're not. These other folks have additional criteria to meet. So until you've actually finished some projects, until you've actually done certain things, there's an application process to meet with these two. It is included in the membership, but someone can't join the next day. Meet with these folks. It needs to be in the context of, have you actually done stuff with teams in our structure in order to connect to it? In terms of materials included, this is something where when our group started, we didn't have any of this stuff. The whole process works and gets people building games and learning together. Even without it, a lot of this you can see is supplemental. We have our playbook and that builds up a ton of information about the history of our group and how it works. Our video courses, which now have been used by, this number's out of date, about a quarter of a million people. Our textbook, which about 200,000 people have used. That's my textbook. It's about over 500 some pages, uh, 559. Covers six game types, source code examples. A lot of our new pitches from first time project leads, which by the way, I'm proud to say about a third of our members go on to be project leads. It's not like a company where you got to work your way for a decade. You can become a project lead if you want to and I'll help you do it. A lot of our project leads actually start from the example code from this textbook. And it provides six different genres of games with a starter code. I help them build a schedule around that, build a plan around that. And then over a period of six weeks to six months, collaboratively and making that happen, turning to support for help with me, with Karen, with Kartik, with Ryan, and so on. But again, to over strategy guide, basically for six years, I was writing a blog entry on an average of one a week about game development at an introductory level, variety of topics. What I did here for the developer strategy guide is I grouped the 50 highest traffic, the best received articles from that, compiled it by category, made another book out of it. Gamkito Udemy to Teams Supplement. So even though our group is Home Team Game Dev, my company is Gamkito LLC. 
part of why group used to be called Gam Keto Club, if you ever heard that name in my YouTube videos. And guts is what I like to call this is basically so you're coming off doing video courses, you've done our introductory course that like I say, a quarter million people have gone through on Udemy, code your first game.com. Maybe you've also started my second course, how to program games. And at that point, you still have some questions about okay, well, it was easy when I could kind of have the hand holding the guidance of step one, here's what to do step two, here's what to do. On the other end of that spectrum, you're going to be building games that are original projects. With some more vague task definition, you can sort you can coordinate that a bit with the lead. But part of the difficulty is figure out how to fragment a project or figure out the fundamentals of programming at a deep enough level that you can recombine them. Guts, it's a smaller booklet, but it's an exercise booklet. And it has several kinds of exercises for doing that because we help people smooth that transition from video course reliance on just doing original projects back to back year round. And more about that in a second. Friendly Coding, as one of our members, now currently alumni, Jeremy Jackson wrote this guide where a lot of our people came in where they had a bit of programming experience, maybe taken a programming class, done some online tutorials, but had never made programming projects with teams before. And it's a short booklet, but again, it's really covers some important points about when you're wading into team projects, gives us some added confidence about certain practices that make it easier, go more smoothly, and what a powerful skill it is, right? To be able to work with other people opens us up beyond our own skill sets, opens up beyond our own experience to draw upon, and so many more things become possible at such a higher level. Self-command, how to get yourself to do things. This is a productivity audiobook I put together. It's five hours long. And this is actually something more general because one of the things I ran to as a trainer is that we would have people who they knew what they wanted to do. They had everything they needed to be able to do it. They weren't doing it. And they couldn't figure out a good way to focus their attention, to focus their time, to stay on task, to get the right mindset, or they couldn't figure out what was chewing them up and causing them to kind of, to, to not dive into the task head first. And one thing I realized was that that's a pretty universal problem, right? When I started my podcast, when I started my video courses, when I started writing textbooks, when I started making iPhone games, any variety of things that I've done in my life, I went into it with a certain approach that enabled me to stick to it long enough to get the results I wanted out of it. And so I encapsulated that in this audio program, fully included with membership in our group. That's what self-command is. And I want to stress all these materials are optional, right? No one's quizzing you on this. No one's testing you on this. This isn't required reading. These are just things you have access to at no added cost when you're a member of our group. Young Video Game Developers Journal. This is one actually back from 2007. At that point, I made 45 freeware games and each page there is a summary of notes learned from that project, some takeaways. The other nice thing about those is because those were made solo as freeware, those can also be kind of a nice, easy browsing. Think of like a magazine for possible project ideas to start with. Sometimes when someone's trying to pitch their very first project, it gets ambitious by their second, third, fourth, fifth pitch. For their first pitch, it can be difficult because we know we need to keep things basic. But it can be hard because a lot of the games that we enjoy are built by big teams over long spans of time. This can be a great way to shop and browse and figure out what's a good starting kind of project template to start from. There's a perfect guide for you right there. Collective resource library. This is a thing which collectively, this is the only resource that's not solely put together by me here, or I guess Jeremy Jackson in the case of team coding booklet. But for collective resource library, that's a really, really important place where we have an organized Trello. Where what we've done is we have columns, pixel art, learning Unity, learning JavaScript, team management, sound effects creation, and just various kinds of columns, some marketing questions, social media questions, and so on. And how it works is, is if a member has found a resource out there in the universe, helpful, often a free resource, a free website, occasionally a paid one, but they found it was worth it, they used it, they applied it, they said, you know what, I can vouch for this. I would encourage, I would recommend doing this. I would recommend reading this. They create a card for it. And so now since 2015, we've been accumulating cards in those columns of vetted, actually useful stuff. And I cannot stress enough the difference, right? There's infinite material out there, but the challenge is finding what's actually useful. Everything here is actually used by somebody. And we're pretty strict about that. We don't, we, this is not something people just went out there and Googled some stuff. These are things people used and found helpful and helps you sort out and go straight to my time's limited, my time's valuable. Show me some stuff that's going to work. That's how you do it. Now, as far as applying to join, there's an application process. Let's actually look at that application process because it's not a ton of material, but it's important. And uh, this has been sort of a new addition past year. I think it's really benefited our organization and our members. First off, you give your email address. Of course, I need that to contact you. Uh, there is a question here about the dues and the dues. Two notes about that. One, it's not a free group, right? I pay my trainers well for being teachers. I teach our members directly. I also help edit our meeting videos weekly. There's a ton of back end structure we use to make our group possible. This is not a free organization. That said, if the dues are outside your budget, we do have an option to mark that if you would need your dues covered. If you are in a situation where the 
a week where you live, where you're currently out of work, where you're, who knows your situation. If you need that to participate, you can check that box. There's no shame in it. We don't call attention to who's supported by dues and who isn't. There's probably a longer waiting list. And the way that works is that people I've met throughout my career from throughout the industry say, Chris, I love what you're doing. I respect you're doing. You're getting people results, but I don't personally need it. I'm past that experience point or I'm already doing games commercially or whatever it is, but they support my mission. They can support me on patreon.com and they're not really supporting me. They're supporting those people in our group who couldn't otherwise afford participation. And ultimately that helps everybody. That enables us to have members in more places in the world, more backgrounds in life. And it's really, it's been a, a great thing for a fraction of our members in our community to be supported. But again, there's a longer wait list for that. Obviously, if you can pay for it, it's going to get you in the group sooner. What's your name? Are you 18 years or older? We're only able to help people 18 years or older. There's legal reasons having to do with ownership, property, IP rights, and so on. Oh, speaking of which, another important point while I say property rights, everything you make in hometeamgamedev.com, you retain ownership over. If you write code, you can go use that code in somewhere else. You can sell it on the asset store. If you make a model, you can use that model in any other game you ever make. You make a song. We've had members who made songs and projects at Home Team who then went on to sell albums on iTunes of music they made to put in games and Home Team. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission. They didn't have to get anything signed. We didn't own it. All we ask as part of a membership agreement, which is further down on this page, is that we're able to keep the games up in their entirety as freeware. That's to avoid ripping apart people's portfolios. Because out of the 90 some games we've released since 2015, you know, people want to be able to point to the stuff. Hey, check out this thing I worked on. They want to show their friends and family. They want to show HR people. They can't do that if they start shredding them up by bending them pulled down and so on. So all we ask is we can keep it out there as freeware. Are you looking to be involved in team projects? We're real clear about this. This is a group where what we do is we build games collaboratively. This is not a solo support group. There's nothing wrong with those. That's not what we are. I personally have found that a lot of the benefits come from the morale boost we get from when I wake up and my game is suddenly better because someone else is chipping away at it, that's awesome. That helps keep me forward. I find that my motivation's higher when each contribution I make to my project is going to help somebody else and not just myself. That's a really strong motivator. And again, remember too, the benefit here of everyone you're working with in these groups, every project lead you have, every collaborator you have can turn to me for help or any of our trainers. And so you know all of them can follow through on the things that they mean to do. And a lot of the learning happens when someone picks on, picks on a task. They say, I'm going to try this out. If they can't figure it out, they schedule time with me to work with them, one of our trainers, or otherwise our leads and someone can fill in. But team projects is what it's all about. It's good for morale, gets you better results in less time. Part of why I started moving my main business out of one-on-one tr private training into home team as a group collaborative process is that I've seen things where a solo developer might take a year and a third, year and a half, year and two thirds to make something that a team of a handful of beginners can knock out better in two or three months. The effects are enormously multiplied when we have collaborators. And here we got an option for a gift you want to receive when you register. You can get my audiobook at no cost or enjoy game dev deck no cost. Let me clear about a couple of those things. One, I typically now there's a bit of a wait list on these. I send these out when you get your application status notification. So sometimes that's three weeks, sometimes that's six weeks, roughly a month at the time of this video. That might go up depending on how this video does. But this is a no at a cost to you. And this is also no, no obligation, right? You don't have to actually join our group. This is yours to keep whether or not you join us. I want you to help benefit from the process and your attention and time you put into this thing. It's only fair. Background experience. And I like to stress that this is not about being impressive. You're not applying for a job. All I'm trying to do here is understand, do you know what you're getting yourself into? And uh, are you actually going to do it? And so we've got a few short answers, each one, and we limit it to about one paragraph. I don't want you writing essays. I don't want to read your essays, <laughs> right? Uh, this is short. This is just, hey, if you've been doing stuff, let us know. If you haven't, if nothing else, you can take codeyourfirstgame.com. That's my video course used by now, about a quarter of a million people. It takes a two-hour course, do it in one sitting, come back, say you did that, and let me know you care, that taking this seriously, that you're real about it. Here's the other thing about that. Everyone else in the group, also, that joins you after you join, has been through this process. And it weeds out a bunch of the nonsense, leads out a bunch of the people who... Yeah, I'm sure you've been on some team up reddits before. You've probably been on some situations on you've seen online attempts at teaming up that fell apart and people don't show up and people aren't serious about it. This weeds out those people. You want the people you work with have been through answering three paragraphs. Every now and then someone fills out this form, they'll put two or three word answers. I reject them immediately. I don't care if they are pointed to something really impressive. They're showing that they can't handle a process. They're showing that they aren't actually engaged with it. They're showing they don't actually they haven't thought about it. We don't want them and you don't want to work with them. I partly help protect you from those people when you join our community. Why do you want to do it? 
what would you do as a member in our community? And of course, you know, that could change. But what you're, what you're initially picturing yourself doing, here's another thing. I found out people answering these questions, our group has just, it's really helped since we added these questions in here. When you've thought about this before you join, you get so much more when you jump into it because you've already pictured how you're going to use it. it just helps everyone succeed when you get, in, get involved. Anti-harassment policy, we're pretty clear about this. This is something that we are a supportive community. We're a community of people around the world in different cultures, different backgrounds. Sometimes we have parents whose kids are sitting right next to them at the computer. Those are some various things. I mean, obviously, no making fun of others, no mocking others, no being trollish, etc. We have no tolerance for any of that. We're also a completely a learning community. Everyone's there to be supportive of each other. And one of the things that's most valuable to our group is that all your peers are there to help you understand, to help answer questions, to be patient with your misunderstandings or your confusion when you're beginning. One of the things that separates us from something like, say, Stack Overflow, where just any little person could be out there and being a jerk. We have no tolerance for that. When you're part of a group, you're part of a curated set of people who, if they fail that test, they're not with us anymore. Membership agreement. And again, here's some things where you read, read the details there. But at a high level, the main gist, right, is that you keep your rights to what you create. But we do ask we can keep the games free and available as freeware. They're educational projects or they're, they're learning projects, they're practice projects. And we also find that's really important for a couple reasons. One, again, that gets out the nonsense of people who think that their first or second game is going to be a multi-million dollar hit. Yeah, you don't actually want to be involved with those people. They're dangerous. Secondly, it's something where you are able to take chances. You're able to take risks. One of the things that happens in a workplace is that you don't get to do sounds if you've never done sound before. You don't get to do level design if you've never done level design before. You can't program because you don't have a training in programming. We want you to do things for your first time. We want our game to have your first model, your first sound, your first code in it. And we all work around as best we can to make the best of that, to support it, answer questions about it, build up and find a place for what you've done. But that's possible because we're doing freeware. That takes the pressure off. You can't be involved. No one's on the sidelines in our group. Everyone participates however they wish doing what interests them. That's what makes it work. And last thing with that too, everyone can lead, be a project lead. We're proud to say we've had about a third of our members who've done contributions to our projects become project leads. This is not like industry. You've got to work your way for a decade at the chance for a shot to possibly someday make your game. You want to be a project lead? I help you do it. I help you figure out your schedule, help you figure out the milestones, help you figure out the prototype, help you every single week learn as you go. I've now led hundreds of people through that process, not just through this group, but through previous groups that I've founded and run. We can get you to do it. And all we got to do is we scope it appropriately to the level of experience you're at. If you've been doing games already successfully for years, you can pitch something more ambitious at start. If you're totally starting out, we can help you come up with an idea that you'll be proud of, that you'll learn a lot in the process. Going into your next game, be that much better, better off. And then we have a question about Apollo or Outpost group. So like I mentioned earlier, there are two separate communities now. There's the Apollo community and the Outpost community. And they both use basically they have access to the same materials. They have access to most of the same support trainers. They have access to the basically the same process. Here's the big differences. Okay, and they're outlined here too. Apollo group is live weekly meetings Sunday, 1130 a.m. Not everyone in the group is there. Maybe about, I don't know, 25 percent, 30 percent any given week might participate in those meetings. But that's when pitches happen. That's when leaders uh, share their updates. That's also when guest speakers call in. That's when that stuff happens. Those guest speakers, by the way, are people from industry. We've now had about uh, 100 of those maybe in going. And uh, they call in. Members can ask questions. That becomes episodes of the Home Team Game Dev podcast. So that's the Outpost group. It's bigger. It's got about maybe 85 people at the moment. And out of those people, uh, we've had people who've been making games continuously in that group since 2015. Who are kind of veterans at not just game development but the process and have really nailed after leading project for project and being contributing su substantially over the weeks uh very involved with it there's people who learn from each other that way the apollo group that's the apollo group the outpost group is newer it's only been around for about a quarter of a year at this point maybe close going closing it on two uh we've already finished several games from there and we're just now at the time of this video spinning up some new ones so also for comparison right now the out the apollo group has six games in development in parallel the Outpost group currently has two, soon to be four, but there's some scale differences there too. If you lead a project in Apollo group, you're probably there live in meeting, presenting over a Zoom call your plans, your presentation, then weekly doing updates on what's been going on with your project's team to the other people who are there in the group. If you're in the Outpost group, then you're pre-recording videos, screen recording, narrating that same information, your pitch presentation, and then weekly updates. But either way, and this is a critical point to make that I want to make sure we don't lose here. You're getting practice at a really valuable skill. In the Apollo group, you're getting experience at live public speaking. I mean, virtually, digitally, 
but presenting on a weekly basis updates to your peers, to a group of people, a mix of people you work with, a mix of people who are basically strangers or newer people who are coming in. And if you're doing it in the outpost group, then you're developing practice at screen recording, at narrating, at this set of skills that if it's intimidating, here's what I'll say. One, we've had lots of people figure it out and we'll help you figure it out. Two, these are really powerful skills to have in life, not just in game development, but they're valuable game development, but in life for the rest of your career. To be able to be that person who can stand up and say, I have a plan and here's how we can do it. To be able to be the person who can speak on behalf of a team and say, here's what's been going on. Here's our next steps. That kind of power to unlock in your life is an enormous benefit to any career track, to any educational pathway. And like I say, so if you're in Apollo, it's live digitally. Yes, it's live speaking weekly. If you're project leading, if you're an outpost, it is screen recording in the same way that you'd be making YouTube tutorials making marketing videos, editing, doing YouTube videos, that kind of thing. Uh, either way, a valuable set of skills to get practice at, and I can help you hone that. That said, I also want to reinforce, no one's required to be a lead. There's no pressure on that. We encourage it. We're open to it. We'll help you do it if you want to. But the other side of the fact, we've had a third of our members go on to be project leads. Two thirds of members are just happy contributing on projects, chipping in, honing their particular specialist skills, whatever bearing that responsibility of keeping the whole team on track towards release. Outpost, in addition to being completely times and agnostic, is a smaller group. And because that's also, it's a bit slower paced in terms of activity, right? If you go a few days without being on the Apollo Slack forum, you might come back to tons of messages on Red and trying to catch up on all that. If you check in once or twice a week on the Outpost Slack forum, you're probably on top of things. It's just not as bustling as in chat and so on, which is that what some people want, right? Depending on the level of time you have to put towards this stuff. You want to find the one's pace for you. If you have questions about matching, you could actually check either one. When I email you with your acceptance, we can then sort out which one you belong in. But if you have a clear choice of you like the idea of those live meetings, or you like the idea of not worrying about the times and not worrying about having a consistent time on Sunday to try to make those meetings, then maybe Outpost is a better fit. And we've got our data privacy notice about what we store and all that. So that's the application process. And then typically, depends on how many people are in the application right now, probably looking at about a, about a month, I think my page indicates, but about a month for uh, for hearing back. Uh, of course, it's longer if you apply for having your dues covered. And we've got a list here of some of our games we've released in the, uh, since 2015. Tons of those you could play if you're curious. So once you get accepted, you can sign into our member site. You'll get sign-in information for that. So here's what members see when they sign in. And this is an embed of the most recent meeting video. Depending on if you're Apollo or Outpost, you see a different meeting video. These screenshots are games because we had a pitch and the project lead was showing examples of graphics or gameplay kind of like these. And then below, we have a list of our videos from our most recent pitches. So you can browse the pitches of current projects and see the release dates. Our schedules are all staggered. So there's games at any given time. They're starting, they're finishing, they're mid-development, which is nice. So if you want to jump into one that's starting out, if you want to jump into one that's near release, you can wait in and out. By the way, that's another thing that makes our group different in two ways. One, projects aren't assigned to you. You're not told what game to work on. Tasks aren't assigned to you. No one's telling you, you do this like a job would. You pick your tasks. And we make we have a system in place to make it very easy to see what can be done, to discuss with the leads what you want to do. You can coordinate with me and help you figure out tasks. But it's very self-driven by you decide what you want to do, what you want to learn, what you want to practice. We find a way to fit that into one of the current community projects. And you do it. If you have questions about how to do it, a couple things happen. One, if you don't get it done, no one's upset at you. No one's mad at you. Life goes on. We're a practice community. Someone else will fill in. The lead will fill in. I'll fill in. Or if you want to schedule time with me in office hours, I'll help teach you how to do the thing that you couldn't figure out. And that's where a lot of our learning happens. One of our recent project leads began from knowing no gain volume background whatsoever, began by doing really simple tasks, M key to mute, P key to pause, just some very basic graphics kind of stuff to get things started. Now pitching lead a project made just enormous strides in the time between. In the middle, there was another game where he had done a ton of the programming work because by then he had built up this confidence and his experience doing it, applying everything he did to these actual original games being built and not just building a dependency on tutorials. So we'd love to see that kind of story. And that's a lot of where people came out of. A lot of our leads again, came in with no prior experience besides maybe our free course, CodeYourFirstGame.com. And in terms of defining your own tasks, the other side to that is if there's a kind of game you want to work on or a kind of part of games you want to work on, you're really into AI, maybe one of our current projects doesn't totally involve the kind of AI you want to do with. You really want to deal with, uh, I don't know, an inventory system. You want to write code or do art or do sound or do music for a certain type of genre that doesn't currently fit what we have, the answer in our group is you pitch and start that project. 
and I hope set you up with the skills to do that. Now, as far as how we collaborate, we collaborate over a few different services. We use Slack for communications between our teams. We use Trello for our schedules of weekly tasks per project. We have GitHub, and that's where our projects all keep their code for sharing and collaborating files. We have a list of our released games. We add our resources. This is where you can immediately access when you're a member all of our different links, like I showed on the main page, to the different resources included in membership. So you can get all those immediately when you join. Video archives, all of our past speakers. And we also have this help system. Here I know it looks pretty basic, but there's a lot of information here that over the past five years, a lot of that learning is encapsulated in the answers to these questions about what makes our approach different, our history and origins, pitching leading projects. So a lot of questions that people used to come to me with, I document into this help system so you can browse those answers, familiarize yourself with whatever you need. Again, once again, not required reading, but if you want to lead a project, you don't even have to ask me to learn more about how to do those things. You can find out how in our backend system. Another important difference in our process and structure than say, again, game development company or studio job or even a school is that people can and do and are encouraged to shift freely between projects one week to the next. That let's say there's, so like I say, there's currently at the time of this video, six projects going on in Apollo. It's entirely fine for me to do level design in one game this week. Next week, do sound effects in a different game. Third week, take the week off. Don't ask anybody. Don't tell anybody. You don't need anybody's permission. Don't run it by anybody. Fourth week, go back to this other project, do a little bit of code on it. We encourage that cross-functional fluency. It helps make you a better communicator. Helps you become a better project leader when you can kind of understand different kind of roles people involve in. Helps us also scratch our itch for, there's this balance, right? There's things that we're more comfortable in. Maybe I've had a little more background in 2D art or I've had a little more background in modeling and sound effects and music and code, whatever it is, level design. I can do the things I'm good at, feel good about reminding myself, yeah, I am good at some things. And then kind of struggle on the learning curve of something I'm newer at in some other project. And that very much is part of how it works, where we kind of maintain that rhythm or motivation by doing things we're good at, doing things we're less good at. But also, again, chipping in when we have time. There's some weeks where a member might chip in on four projects in the same week in different ways. There's other weeks where you might disappear for a week or two, and that's fine. Right? We're all structured very flexibly. Our leads understand this going into the process. Everyone in our community understands this process and approach in a way that just because you chip in on something, you're not stuck with that project until it's released, you'll be in the credits. And in fact, you'll see this on all of our credits. Our credits are ultra specific. This is another important thing about what we do and how our group operates. Every single credit is specific. It's not like here's a pile of programmers. Here's a pile of sound effects people. It says, here's the features this person programmed. Here's the sounds this person did. Here's the music this person composed. And the reason why this is important is many fold, right? I mean, one, when you first show a project you develop to a family member, to a recruiter, what's their first question? Okay, what part did you do? It's super clear. It's right there. It's extremely explicit. Here's the part you did. This is also valuable because it helps take the pressure off. Again, we have people who are staggeringly different experience levels. We have people who have been doing it for seven years, making games, actually, in some cases, almost five years in our group alone. In other cases, we have people who just starting out, just finished my codeyourfirstgame.com Udemy course and are just now putting their foot in the water. Well, here's the thing. When it's clear about who did what, it takes the pressure off. Let's say I'm a 3D modeler who's very experienced with 3D modeling. I'm not, but let's say I am. Okay, it says what models I did. Somebody else, their first time in Blender making something, chipping into a game, it's going to say in the credits, they did that. I don't have to fear that someone's going to look at that model and think I did that as the experienced person. And this helps keep the pressure down, which again is important to us. Because are we here to learn? We're here to practice. We're here to experiment, to explore. And it's what we do. We crank out game after game, not just back to back, but many in parallel with people chipping in across the board on different projects, learning different skills. And a lot of it's also really valuable for the learning where it gives you a chance to really see the pattern. One of the things I figured out also as a trainer, a downside to when I work with people who used to be one project at a time only, is that let's say a certain kind of question comes up, how to program a menu, how to do collision code how to handle an inventory system, how to handle keyboard input. It'll come up once in the lifetime of a project. And if that project is a year, year and a half long project, that means I've only dealt with that question one time in a year, year and a half. I probably didn't really learn it. I got no repetition. I got no variation. That's where the learning happens. With multiple projects in parallel, you can safely and freely experiment in, go across, get help if you get stuck in. Suddenly, we have a case where someone will learn how to do menus in one game and go practice that by doing variations on two or three other projects. Well, as someone who wants to really get really good at particle effects, try out a few different approaches and a few different projects. You get this chance to really bask in in detail the parts that interest you, that you want to practice, that you want to learn, to get experience with them in different kind of contexts. So it's not just, oh, I guess I figured that out once. 
It's I've proven. I know how to do that. I can fit in different kind of code bases. I can fit in different kind of approaches. I can fit different kind of use cases, different perspectives, different uses of it. And that's where a lot of our strengths and learning come from. And uh, yeah, so we've been doing this now, like I say, since 2015, cranked out over 90 games this way. And we've released every single game. I think maybe one exception for a pretty extreme emergency special case. We've released every single one of these 90 games, again, Sans 1, on time, on multi-month schedules, multi-month pipelines. It's how we do. It's how our process works. And that's part of the power to learn to you're learning to release things to finish things to get things out there and then to move on to your next projects which is where uh, a lot of learning really happens right is that repetition of where i can look back on how i wish i would have done something different we help you move on to the next one so you can apply to the next one to be that much better from the ground up applying what you wish you'd known in the previous project and you just keep repeating 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 if you're interested two things one go to hometeamgamedev.com right now today and apply you can read more about it, answer all your questions you got there, click on apply to join, check us out. Two, while you're waiting for your application to be accepted, or if you've already done it, go to codeyourfirstgame.com. That'll redirect you to my Udemy course. And like I say, we've had plenty of people go through this. This is a great introduction to the basics of gameplay programming. You don't have to do this. We have people who are in group who've only ever used Unity and they're fine. But if you'd like to see what our retro programming stuff looks like, where you're doing your own input code, your own graphics, your own collision, and so on. Like I say, it opens up a lot of concepts to get more out of what we do with the engines. So that then when people are on to their Unity projects for intermediate and advanced games, they get more power out of it. They get more efficiency out of their time for a year-round process, learning and building games together. Lovely community. Would love to have you join us in hometeamgamedev.com.